on electric bikes and micro mobility. My name's Mick O'Regan and it's my great pleasure to be the moderator tonight. I wanna to start by acknowledging that I'm in Bundjalung country here on the northeast corner of New South Wales. And I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of this beautiful place and their elders past, present and emerging. This is a zero emissions Byron webinar and it's part of our series, the electric vehicle revolution, the EV revolution. And it's designed to cover all aspects of EV adoption from charging, driving range, converting combustion vehicles and other types of electric transport. The aim of this series is to encourage people to consider converting to an EV from an internal combustion car to reduce their carbon emissions and to stop using fossil fuels. Our principal sponsor is Bank Australia, our major sponsor is NRMA, and our community sponsors are Innova Community Energy, Light Touch Solar and Electrical, and Club Car. As I mentioned, electric bikes and micro mobility is the seventh webinar in the ZEB series on the EV revolution, and it's the second last in our series of eight. ZEB is very pleased to welcome two expert guests with us tonight. Michelle Nazari, the founder and CEO of Fonzarelli, and Byron Local, Luke Young, the founder of Sunshine Cycles. So welcome to you both. Now, there's a whole range of issues that are going to come up in this webinar about everything from the cost of e-bikes and e-scooters to issues about range and battery weight and size. But I do want to start with Luke, uh, who is, as I said, the founder of Sunshine Cycles. Now, that's an electric bicycle rental business that's based here in the Byron Shire. Now, as I understand it, disenchanted with the perennial traffic problems in Byron Bay, Luke Young, an ex-gas and oil industry rigger, set up Sunshine Cycles in 2016 with a vision to use renewable energy and sustainable technology to empower the local community. Sunshine Cycles are powered by the sun via off-grid pods in Byron Bay, Brunswick Heads and Kingscliff here in New South Wales, and also Kira Beach in Queensland. So we'll hear from Luke in just a moment, but before we do, I'm also going to introduce Michelle, Michelle Nazari. Michelle is equal parts entrepreneur, environmentalist, and innovator. Her great strengths are her passion and ability to execute with key expertise in production development, production techniques, and marketing and sales. Before Fonzarelli, Michelle worked in the transport industry, developing and manufacturing diesel, hybrid and electric buses. She's also a passionate motorcycle enthusiast and saw there was a potential in applying the electric powertrain technology to something much smaller than an electric bus. Using her intimate knowledge of the automotive industry, Michelle has built Fonzarelli from the ground up. So it's a really big welcome to Michelle and to Luke. And to get the ball rolling tonight, Luke, could I throw it to you? So over to you, Luke. Uh, thanks, Mick. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. This interesting discussion. Um, yeah, it's been a bit of a journey for us. With the, we started with the uh, Sunshine Cycles uh, first prototype, um, which is a shipping container, and we tried automating the door and set up a solar system on it to charge the bikes. We had that in Byron, and it went really well. And off the back of that, we got into an um, acceleration program energy lab um, through the SAUDI program in northern New South Wales. Um, and that was really good. We picked up our first um, investor and we went into an R&D phase and developed the new micropods, which are about the size of a van. They're made out of recycled plastics uh, and aluminium and they're all integrated solar uh, and integrated IoT. So they're all remote controlled from um, central platform. Uh, the idea being we can um, scale this and hopefully eventually and have a really um, intuitive app uh, rather than third party apps that we're using at the moment and offer um, people visiting areas an alternative way to view the area in comfort and style and have a lot of fun with their friends and families and and see the outer areas of the beautiful places that we live around the country um, through that we also started um, working on our own bike designs and styles and developing that and we uh, we manufacture and import um, e-bikes under uh, easy riders ezrideerz -E um, company um, which we're still doing today uh, but I just want to share today about, uh, you know, working in this space and how I imagine in the future we, um, we deal with the um, issues surrounding transport and, and electric transport and some of the issues with it. So I'm just going to open up a slideshow. Excuse my giant hand. Um, okay. 
Okay, can you all see that okay? Looks good. Okay, so basically how I visualise the mobility in the future is endpoint transport, which we have small electric vehicles for. So basically really lightweight cars, uh, uh, bikes and that sort of thing. So, you know, maybe uh, we're talking maybe 100 years time, but we're looking at how, you know, one of the major things we face is all the infrastructure to build heavy roads and one of the problems with you know fossil fuels as we know is the inefficiency we're taking um, and extracting oil and gas uh, from faraway places huge expense in the extraction process shipping them to uh, refineries shipping them back all around the world to uh, fuel service centers putting them in the cars the cars are creating noise and heat which we're surrounding ourselves with and also cutting off wildlife corridors and that sort of thing for animals and really you know, as we know in Australia, so many animals get run over and that's really affecting the ability of nature to uh, have its cyclical kind of um, uh, events happening with, with wildlife. So basically a decentralised system whereby we have, get around our neighbourhood in a much lower infrastructure roads because most of the electric vehicles that we need to get from A to B for like 10 to 20 kilometres are quite lightweight. So you've got electric bikes, electric motorbikes, scooters and small little cars. Um, and look, eventually, I think that a lot of this will be coming through on a share economy where we'll just basically whatever we need to get from A to B, we'll put in our destination and we'll just um, through AI and um, integration of automated vehicles, that'll just become apparent. So what you can see here is, uh, you know, some images of some future uh, drones. So basically, the advantage of this is that we live in smaller community uh, centres that we get around and they're very, you know, we can rewild the the, um, the countryside around there. The animals can move freely. We have smaller lightweight vehicles. And if we want to go further, we might get in something like this. We might just say, jump on our electric bike and go down to a solar shed whereby there's, um, uh, you know, we get on an automated Uber and they go up um, and basically above this, up over ground. So basically to, to get away from the um, infrastructure of, roads we need to either go up, up or under so been a lot of work as you know with um, Elon Musk with his um, Hyperloop and that sort of thing the boring projects but that's for longer distance so these sort of things can travel us you know up to one to 200 kilometers quite quickly and efficiently uh, into the future and then when we get to our centers then we get back into our different modes of, uh, of electric transport which we're working on now and here's a few examples that I've, I've sort of pulled up uh, here you can see an automated vehicle. So the idea will be with a share economy, so there's so much inefficiency now whereby we are all, in, you know, if you sit on the highway, we're all sitting in one car. Uh, is You know, there's heat and noise. So these sort of things, basically, yeah, you put your destination where you want to go. You'll hop into something like this. This might take you to a drone station, which might then take you across to um, some more sort of just super uber uh, local uh, sort of vehicles, um, take you across to something like this. And this is the sort of uh, technology. So when we're talking about saving energy or creating electric energy, one of the main areas is efficiency, you know. Um, so with electric vehicles, they're so much more efficient. There's less moving parts. You have to transfer the energy less far as we do with fossil fuels. And then when we get into things like hyperloops, you know, we, we, um, we remove... Um, Things like wind, wind uh, and air resistance, so they are capable of doing far, far greater speeds. You know, potentially thousands of kilometres an hour, like space, um, and that sort of thing. You can have running and have another loop that meets it, and you, you know, have it going across. So we could potentially go in, into um, continental on these sort of things. So that's what I'm thinking for the future. You know, we have small communities where we have light electric vehicles. We get around. We're not disturbing all the wildlife. We can rewild a lot of the country. We go up and above to these sort of uh, links and destinations and then we get on hyperloops to go further. And it's all done via automated um, uh, transport. So AI will be sort of controlling the, um, that process. Um, here's some of the examples of how the hyperloops sort of systems may look with um, above ground. Um, I know Boring Project through Elon Musk, they're working on uh, reducing the cost significantly for um, underground boring uh, tunneling. And um, they're getting that down to about a quarter of what it was just by reducing the diameter of some of these systems. 
Um, got a few pictures here just of how they might work. So um, you can see down the bottom there, like they can be used a bit like um, a bit like they do with the um, you know the hadron collider, where they, where yeah, basically you levitate off magnets and you propel through magnetic current, all run just from small electric hubs. Um, and you also a good thing with these systems, and I've heard them talk about this, is being a sphere, this, the way they're built to go under oceans and that sort of thing makes them also really intrinsically strong in terms of pressure. So you can actually suck uh, uh, the air out of them to make them um, they're really low friction. Um, as you, see, you can see that here, some of the levitation and the um, how they might look. And this is um, an image of a station, what it might be like. So you could imagine, you know, riding on your electric uh, automated vehicle down to a drone station that's run off solar. Automated drone would pick you up and fly you uh, and they'd all have collision uh, protection through the AI, it would run everything and drop us somewhere like this. So it'd be really, really a lot more efficient way of getting around, a lot better for the environment, um, a lot smarter way of doing things. Um, yeah, so that's the basically how I'm thinking into the future. Like at the moment, I'm just looking at the electric bikes and that sort of thing and learning about it. But the you know into the future, we're really looking at how do we decrease uh, increase efficiency. I think, uh, and also storage of power. So maybe in 100 years, we found a whole new system of power that's non-electrical. But um, you know, we have to start somewhere. So that's where we're starting now. Um, yeah, I've got a list of there: zero emissions, high speed, stable low environmental impact, um, just working with natural cycles and elements, a lower cost, super efficient, reliable, safe and enjoyable. And that's how I think we're gonna make it happen. And I'm, I know there's a lot of people thinking with different thoughts and I think together we'll, we'll get there if we, we dream and put some energy into this stuff. So um, oh, now if we can uh, just play the, um, the video, Glenn, I'm just gonna just play a little video of how our system works that you can see in the background. Um, should play here. There you go. So um, I don't know if I'm talking over this, but I'll, I can let you watch this. It's uh, the bikes that we've um, we've sort of manufactured. We've got another style that we've made now um, that we'll be um, bringing to the pods when we rel relaunch them next month. So it's all run off our third party app. Uh, we're going to redevelop our own app where it's got self-guided mm -hmm. tours and show people where the things things are to see local businesses and points of interest. And we've had really good feedback from people. Hopefully, eventually, we can move um, to other, you know, rural and um, tourism centres around the country. And the more we develop, the more we can create it and pr from a price point for locals to be able to have really cheap, efficient transport as well. So. So those sheds are all made out of um, yeah, mod woods and recycled plastics. Um, and this is just the operating system for the GPS locking technology. Uh, the, the pods all behind that screen there at the back, it's all integrated like a wave, but we've got um, an off-grid power system and uh, just uh, four, four or 5G routers that, that we uh, can remote really monitor and control all that stuff. Um, and then they go, they're away. So yeah, that's basically our, our system that we're using. You can play, you can either play that to the end or however, if you want to move across, it's, it's all basically just more of, more of the same of, of how the system works. Yeah, so like I said, this is all very early stage, but it's our first attempt at, you know, seeing what works and how to deal with the customer experience and make better experience. So um, I guess we're all working on this stuff together to um, continue and improve. Pretty nice uh, video shot there down in Byron at uh, Elements Resort.
doesn't show us getting bogged putting that out on the uh, grass there, which is good. And those pods automatically open and close, so they're secure. Um, eventually, uh, members will be able to open and close them automatically. So, yeah, that's um, all from me. Thanks, Mick. That, that's great, Luke. I mean, not only was there some fantastic shots of, of the Byron Headland, it was really great to see the kind of context in which those bikes could be used, because I imagine that for tourists, they would have huge appeal. Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, a lot of tourists kind of are stuck in the central town. And you know, as we know, we've got traffic issues in Byron. So having them strategically placed around town where people can jump on a bike and, and get to experience e-bikes and you know, they've got like a 60 kilometre range, so they can go to Mullumbimby or uh, Bangalore, even out to Killam Falls and some of these places and really get to experience the beautiful natural world we live in. So it's a good way to educate healthy and... Right, indeed. And now, now we're going to go in just a moment to Michelle Nazari from Fonzarelli to hear her presentation. But I just wanted to ask you very quickly, because I did notice in the, in the video there were requirements about wearing helmets is necessitated by Australian law. Just with, say, when you said that you could ride, say, from Byron Bay to Mullumbimby, is it, are these uh, street legal, these bikes you can ride on the road? Yeah. Yes, yes. They're all um, within um, uh, Australian regulations, and we've got all uh, new uh, clean helmets in the shed that we always check every day, right. um, replace when there's any damage. So, yeah, we've got a good maintenance schedule. Everything's, um, everything's uh, yeah, run to Australian standards. Great. Okay. Now, when, when we come back after Michelle's presentation, some general questions i would like to ask you about the cost uh both the cost of manufacturing and the cost of renting but i don't want to leave michelle waiting any longer um michelle nazari as i said at the top is the founder and ceo of fonzarelli um before we hear from you is that a happy days reference i think you might be muted are you are you hearing me I'm, I have a my, hello. hello. Sorry, I was <laughs> my computer was locking itself. <laughs> hello, hello. I speak. yeah. Lovely, lovely to hear your yes, voice. Yes, it, it is a Fonzarelli reference. So, um, actually, uh, a lot of people think my surname is Fonzarelli, it's Nazari. So, uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a take on the Italian thing, and that obviously the Fonz was a badass and uh, but a good guy at heart. And so, we sort of took that as um, as our um, name take and take and um. Yeah, and, and it served us pretty well, although we've sort of rebranded recently to Fonz and uh, I think just to, you know, reach out to that younger market who apparently don't know who the hell Fonz really is. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. Anyway, look, um, thank you, Luke, for your presentation. Michelle, the floor is yours. Uh, take thank us through, through yours. Thanks very much. Um, so I'll just um, see if I can share my screen. There we go. Right. Is that sharing? Hello? I'm I'm seeing a very interesting looking motorbike. So okay, uh, I, okay. Bike, so I, think, I think we're away. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, um, I'll just tell you a little bit about funds to get started. So we started the company back in 2010. Um, and the idea was to um, reduce congestion on the street and find more convenient ways to get around uh, rather than myself at the time going to Sydney Uni and living about six kilometres away and catching public transport and it would take me about an hour and 15 minutes to get there by buses or about 35 minutes to get there on foot and um, that was uh, that was one of, one of the precursors for the for the business and um, and since then it's just been about creating fun convenient and um, performance bikes and um, I think where where we're sitting today is um, micro mobility and uh, e-bikes, bicycles, electric motorbikes and, and e-mobility in general is just absolutely going off. I think with COVID, um, there's been a huge increase in the amount of people that want to get off the roads. There's a lot more congestion than there's ever been um, around New South Wales and Australia, I think. Um, and, um, and so people are looking for different mobility solutions and I think there's two great options. You either go into the share community, which is absolutely awesome and, and doing exceptionally well, 
Um, or you potentially look at downsizing from your um, petrol vehicle, your petrol car, or maybe two petrol cars, and potentially either joining the, um, the sharing community in such a way as what Luke's been, um, what Luke's business is, um, or potentially looking at having your own micro mobility solution. And I think the the most important thing when we're we're trying to work that out is like really about choice and and finding a solution in order to see a really large uptake in in e mobility. It's about finding a solution that works for the individual or the family if it is in that case. So. For our, um, for our customers, for example, some people want to have their surf rack on the side of their bike so that they can, you know, go and get down and have an early morning surf and not get stuck in a bit of traffic on the way back. Um, you know, if it's somebody who's got had two cars, they're going down to one and maybe they're looking at, you know, not wanting to purchase something, but joining that sharing economy. Um, so I think the most important thing is um, for manufacturers and developers and, and founders and innovators such as Luke and, and Bonzarelli's team. Um, it's about trying to create solutions that, it, that can potentially work for a range of different people um, so that we can really see that uptake of electric bikes. Um, just I've switched sli slides and as I was watching um, Luke's video, I noticed that he had a, well, there was a slogan across the bottom that said, do not ride on the beach. And I, I'm, I've been told that this beach is a bit north of Byron Bay and apparently it's the one beach you are allowed to ride on. But then I read in your uh, disclaimer at the bottom that it was because it might damage the vehicle. And so <laughs> I hope, <laughs> hope that one's okay. Um, yeah, so um, basically with, um, with our range of vehicles, we're looking at like how to, how to charge the bikes, how to um, have the bikes, like for example, if you, if you don't have, uh, a power source are you going to be able to charge a bike is that going to make you not switch from petrol to electric because you don't have a solution so you know finding ways where you can take the power pack out charge it indoors um, charge it pu public charging infrastructure um, or uh, you know charging directly into the wall socket so that's um that's something that we've been focusing quite heavily on is like what does it look like and how can the individual make it work for them. Um, initially, you know, you think about, okay, well, what's the what's the price difference going to be from going from a petrol bike to to electric? And you know, if it costs eight bucks for petrol um, and you know, eighty cents to charge for a week for electric, um, that's great. Um, but it also has to all work into our lifestyle and be convenient and um, and 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 be fun, I guess. And and so I think it's really important that we create solutions that answer that. So whether it's, you know, going out and exploring um, on an e-bike and being able to, you know, connect around your own city and even have a little bit of local tourism, the things we all can't really commute anywhere. Um, yeah, it's just about finding ways to get your, um, get your life plugged in so that you can actually be a part of the electric revolution, I guess. Um, I think the one of the big barriers is um, upfront cost with electric vehicles, and um, and for for Fonzarelli, obviously, if you're going for share for a sharing economy, you don't have those upfront barriers, which is really great. Um, I, we tried to um, have our bikes coming in at like under four thousand dollars, or people can you know splurge and go up to the Tesla on two wheels as well, which you know there's there's basically, um, you know, finding a solution that suits your budget and um, yeah, that's enjoyable. Um, there we've got some of our power packs. So basically, you know, you're just like pulling that out of the back of the bike um, and charging it inside and um, taking it into your apartment or maybe into your workplace as well and asking your boss to pay for your electricity can also be a good solution. Um, uh, in terms of range, I think that's another big um, barrier for a lot of people. Um, E-bikes are awesome because they're so light and you know you can start to get some decent numbers. So I think it's um, about perception like what do you what do people do in their commute like where are you going? Um, do you need to have a 300 kilometer range and maybe if you're in an electric car and you want to travel down to Sydney it's not going to be convenient. If you're looking at an e-bike or an e-scooter or an e-motorcycle, um, you know, 
50 kilometers, 100, we, we do up to 200 kilometers. Like you can pretty much do anything closely, maybe for a week, but certainly for a day, you can pretty much get around anywhere. So I think technology has really, you know, caught up and from, from when I started, certainly, you know, it's caught up and we're ahead of the curveball now. And, you know, electric, electric vehicles and certainly motorbikes and scooters and, um, and e-bikes can be as cost effective as, um, as petrol. And then with all of the green credentials. Um, so I will show you my video. I do not have a motorbike in that. I don't know if you can hear me. This is our NKD model. Um, we'll, this bike's actually made in, um, most of the content are actually made in New South Wales. So, yeah, so, so with that model there, it does up to, up to 200 kilometers range, 100 kilometers an hour and, um, yeah, and it's mainly made in New South Wales. So from an environmental perspective, you know, it's um, very, uh, very local as well, which is also good for the environment, good for the economy. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was fascinating and, and some lovely images there. Um, Michelle, just to be clear, though, about the costs, because I think for people tuning into the webinar, cost is such an important thing. Mm. What, what are we talking about to buy an e-bike? And I know, I acknowledge yeah. that you said there's a range of solutions and I imagine that relates to different budgets and different needs. But yeah. can you nail that down a bit as to what it costs to get an e-bike? Yeah, so uh, like for, for um, I'm just thinking of some of our um, local customers around the Northern Rivers. Um, most of them are going for our, in their scooter range, they'll go for an Alpha 3 and they, they start at $7,000. Um, that's our top of the line model in the scooters. Um, and that's because I guess if you are going, you know, connecting to different parts of the region, that gives you, you know, up to 85 Ks an hour, 100 kilometers range. Right. Um, if, if, for example, like we do have some customers that use it just for the beach and surf. And um, that's at the, the starting price there is like 3,990. So for four a grand. quality product, yeah, four grand, yeah. Okay. And, and just, just to clarify, um, one of our, our listeners, uh, viewers has, has asked, do you need a motorcycle license in the way that you do for an internal combustion engine motorcycle? Yeah, you, you absolutely do. So right. um, okay. with in, in New South Wales, in Lismore, you can get your license. I think you can get it on a phone, but um, it takes two half days. It's like seven hours of your life and um, you save a hell of a lot of time after that. It's And in New South Wales, it's one of the only states where the government um, subsidizes it heavily. So it's about a hundred bucks compared to about a grand in Victoria. So there is that little advantage. Okay. And, and Luke, just to, to come to you with the rental of the bikes, how much, how much are your bikes costing you? And then what are you renting them for? Um, we got a variety of, uh, to, to manufacture, and land at the bikes for sale. Um, they're costing me or costing the customers? Well, both really. I'm interested in, in what they cost you, um, you know, as a wholesaler, but also in terms of making a viable business, what do you need to rent them out at? Uh, well, we've got a couple of different uh, models um, which we sell. We do, do the road legal ones, which are 250, and then we sell some larger motor ones up to 750 watt for off-road only, private property. Um, so the road legal ones start at about two and a half thousand up to about uh, 3,300 for um, the Z models, which are the rental ones. Uh, and then we sell accessories with them, which are like panniers and carriers and that sort of thing. Um, and um, yeah, so, and then it, we, there's been a lot of problems. I mean, I'm really impressed, um, Michelle, that you're building these in New South Wales. I mean, that's something I'd love to do too, actually moving forward um we still get a lot of our stuff from china so it's um, a very big headache i can assure you of that <laughs> it's um it's a lot of hard work 
No, I'm, I'm really, I'm like Luke. I'm really impressed too because I, as you said that, you know, that most of our parts are made in. I was kind of thinking, you know, you're going to say China, you're going to say Korea, and then when you said New South Wales, I was really, ple you know, pleasantly surprised. Can I just ask you both, and I'll start with you first, Michelle, the, the changes in the technology, because I imagine that there's been rapid improvements in both the quality of the technology and the actual quality of the of the bikes. Is that the case? Has there been a really noticeable up upgrade in the quality of these vehicles? Yeah, I, I, I would say that, um, yes, it, when people think about the technology and the improvement, everybody goes to the battery cells. And I would say that, that there are improvements in battery cells, but also different battery cells are, are suitable for different applications. So something that might be amazing for a Tesla is not necessarily amazing for our top of the range model that needs to do, you know, this sort of torque level compared to our more entry model. Um, I think that a lot of the improvements are around efficiencies like um, motors, you know, um, creating like a mid-drive motor. So you get, you know, better, better efficiency, more torque, um, better performance. Um, and, you know, the management systems that, that the brain, I guess. So I think there's, there's improvements, you know, we've just in our frame, it's chromally. So we've reduced the weight of our frame by 23%, which, gives you an improvement in in range as well. So yeah, there's 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 definite improvements in the technology, but I don't think it just like it singles out down to the battery cell. Right. And Luke, are you are you similarly seeing um, improvements? Yeah, look, the technology that we're using to try and make them cheaper, we're not using um, regenerative uh, braking or any of those sort of things. So it gets quite expensive. Um, components have been a real issue to get. I'm sure Michelle understands for, uh, during COVID because America and Europe have just decided they all want electric bikes. And so we've had massive delays on our components. Uh, but because there's so there's few moving parts, I guess, so they're quite simple um, to build, you know, and they're quite reliable. So um, in terms of that compared with the combustion engine, we've got so many moving parts and heat and stress. Um, you know, they, the quality is great. So, um, I mean, you know, what are we getting at Samsung and those sort of cells, you know, 800 to 1,000 cycles generally, and then the electric motors uh, anywhere up to like 50,000 kilometres. Mm. So, yeah, look, it's, it's really a cheap option, in, even if you pay a bit more upfront in what you're saying, you're, you're saving in uh, petrol and maintenance and that sort of thing. They're a really good option. And I think... Um, you know, the technology will keep improving some of the components, but they're making so many at the moment of, um, the, of the different, you know, motor manufacturers, battery cell manufacturers that the, um, the, the quality is quite good, quite good and, and uh, easy accessible. So. Right. So, so a question to both of you. If there were headaches, if you like, if there were areas where either technology or skill were creating impediments, what would they be if, if there are? Um. I mean, for, for, for us, there certainly are like um, supply of some components has been a bit of a struggle. Um, but I guess our, like for Fonzarelli, it's more been, you know, we're trying to, um, we're trying to change a lot of what we're doing. So it's almost like, although we've been around for a, a while now, over a decade, we're kind of, you know, because we have moved a lot of our uh, man more manufacturing on shore, it's like, you know, we're trying to do all of the systems and procedures of an automotive company, like a, you know, let's say a Toyota, but we have to still have all the same compliance and all the same homologation and, um, you know, legal and all the different aspects to that, and not even to start on the, you know, engineering and production and, and that side of it, you mm -hmm. know, in a team of like 10. So that's probably our biggest challenge is trying to meet every, every end, end to end and um and really deliver on time is probably our biggest challenge. And are there are there other places that are further down that road that you can directly draw upon? Whether I don't know, but Korea or or possibly China or the US mm. are there are there other places where you're looking to to see at what's best practice? Um, <laughs> that's a well, that's a good idea. No, <laughs> um, I yeah, look. I don't know. I don't really think a lot of people are trying to make what we're like, I, I guess when you're going to countries where they do like mass manufacturing, we're doing um, low, what's called low volume manufacturing. So um, it's 
I don't think what we're doing is wrong. We're just doing it with limited resources. So I guess it's more of a, I think we're really on the right path right now. We have a great, great line of products that we're really you know, proud of and that the public seem to like. And it's just about refinement and um, and then I guess like, you know, it's been unstable, the economy. So we were planning to, um, you know, build a, a manufacturing facility. We're, we're based at our HQ is in Sydney. And we were looking to different regional locations to build something that would be more cost effective and uh, with, a, with more physical space than what we have in Redfern. Um, and so, you know, with, with the uncertainty of the economy, that's been, that's changed a lot of things. So I think, you know, Things are stabilised a lot more now, and we just need to, just need to, you know, pull our pants up and get on with it. I guess. <laughs> Excellent. Now I'm going to come to you, Luke, in just one second, but I want to stick with Michelle just for a moment. The um the bike that we're seeing on the on the image on the screen and that and that kind of slatted um, engine cover, for, for want of a better term, does does the actual vehicle get hot? I I've ridden um, internal combustion um, mm. motorcycles in my life. Uh, quite a bit actually and and there yeah. is that thing as, as you would know you know that the bike can get hot engine parts get hot what's the situation with an e-bike are, are there are there issues about heat yeah well they, there can be issues with heat and that's uh, one of the technical challenges you have um when you're building the battery pack because the batteries can't get hot so what the more hot more stress um less longevity of the life cycles of battery cells. So with the lightweight bike, we have we have air cooling. That's how we do it. So those grills serve as a purpose um, for air cooling. Um, and um, yeah, that it is important, but it doesn't get hot to the touch as you would burn your leg on the side of an exhaust or something like that. Right, right. Um, no, you, you don't have that kind of level of heat, yeah. Okay. Now, Luke, to come to you, and, and, and this is the general question, and, and feel free, Michelle, to, to ask, but I just do want to clarify what bikes can be ridden on the road. The bikes that we've seen tonight, are they all bikes that would be registered under state licensing arrangements and you could ride them legally on the road? For, re for registration for yes. us, yes, I yeah. think. Yeah, so, and Luke, your, your bikes are obviously all rideable on the road? Yeah, just for our, our bikes are... Uh, classified as a pedelic, so they're um, they're the same as riding a push bike, uh, so they don't need to be licensed and such. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and yeah. so let's talk about charging bikes, Luke. What's just just go through with us? How do, how do you actually charge an e bike? Um, we've got uh, on on the pods that we we call them some pods that have the uh, off grid solar in them. They have, uh, basically we have like a magnetic pickup on the front of the bike. And when you put the bike back into its dock, it, it meets with that. So that's basically just going to an inverter. So we're still, we're still con uh, con going from uh, so solar to 240 through the inverter, then back to um, the voltage of the chargers, which is um, about 42 volt. Uh, so, you know, like some of the advances we'd like to do is have direct DC to DC charging. Mm -hmm. And how long are we talking about? If, if, if the battery was flat and you needed to, to travel, how long have you got to wait? Oh, okay. So, look, the way a battery charge, and look, Michelle probably know more about this than me, but uh, basically it's the charge cycle. It, you have a battery uh, control system within the uh, battery usually itself, and that'll regulate the flow of um, amps into the battery. Uh, so it'll charge quite rapidly at the early stage. So you might get an 80% recharge in an hour and a half to two hours um, but a, a full charge might take I mean we'll use slightly higher um, uh, power out, out um, charges just so they recharge a bit quicker but you don't want to put too much heat into the battery when you're recharging it and ideally right. you want it to charge a full cycle because it'll level out all the cells and just maintain the health of the battery but you can get a um, you know that'll take about four hours uh, but I think in about an hour and a half to two hours you could or say two hours, you probably do eighty percent. Right, and just to clarify, and I may have missed this, but but is there a battery in the pod to store the solar energy? Yeah, yeah, we do use lipo uh, batteries in in the in the shed, yeah, in the pods. Mm. Right. Okay, Michelle, uh, over to you. From from that point of view of of Fonzarelli bikes, what what are we talking about in terms of of charging time? Yep. So um, on our smallest pack and our fastest charging. Um, it's under an hour to, to go to 80, the same that 80% that you normally measure it on. Um, and it, 
I kind of, because most of our customers charge, uh, like ride the bike during the day and charge of an evening, um, I generally um, recommend people to use our slower chargers unless they need to charge faster or they're you know, particularly impatient or whatever. I think that the slower chargers, they charge over the longest period, which is up to eight hours, depending on the power pack size. But yeah, a lot of people choose our one hour chargers. So right. you've, got, you've got options. Right. And just in terms of, and this is again to both of you, but I'll stay with you, Michelle. In terms of the power, I suppose it's the torque. Uh, that the e-bike can have. I know from being uh, living in the Bar and Shire, you often see people uh, pulling surfboards or, 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 or you know, a couple of toddlers in a, in a baby carriage behind their bicycle. What, yeah. what, what kind of other weight constrictions that an e-bike might have if you wanted to tow you know, either a surfboard or a little trailer or something? Yeah, um, well, there's some, there's some compliance challenges if you wanted to do a trailer. So that's not an easy, op it's not something, it's not an out of the box solution. It's certainly something that you can apply for. And the, and if you went for, I would say maybe not the entry level product, but you'd get more than enough power if you were going for something from $7,000 up. Um, and then, um, but we, you know, there's other solutions like, so, you know, the, the rack on the side that you can put the surfboard and panniers and, and boxes and for babies, you're not not really allowed to have any babies on, on bikes. I think they have to be nine years old in in New South Wales. Um, but yeah, the, I think you know if you if you want to pop your baby, you're going to take an e-bike, and if you want to um, put your surfboard, maybe a, a electric motorbike. Right, and and Luke, the, the similar thing there, I suppose, is because I imagine there would be tourists who would want to do that. The bikes in sunshine cycles. Are there are there any limitations on what people can? either tow or are there prohibitions or anything like that? Uh, not really. We have had a problem uh, just the way the bikes are designed up, but particular bikes that we first launched with um, regarding, um, I mean, with, with, the, with the baby seat, you need a specific seat. It's got some safety inbuilt safety functions, obviously, uh, or a trailer. I mean, we, we can look at the option, but uh, it's just we have an issue with how do we do it with, with the pod? Like, how do we... Yet yeah, make sure that the customer's connected it correctly and it's safely, that sort of thing. So we haven't gone down that path yet, although we would like to, and also with surfboard carriers, but we're just sort of trying to work through how we do that effectively. Um, and, and with the power outage, like with 250 watts, basically it's capped at 25 kilometres an hour. So it's like just riding a, a push bike at a reasonably fast pace in high gear. Uh, and that'll get you up most of the hills. It'll get you up to the lighthouse, you'll have to go down to a low gear. So they're not super powerful as such, it's you're still being active, but the bike's doing most of the work. Whereas yeah. I'm, I'm not sure with Michelle's, I'm sure Michelle's a lot more powerful than us, so. Um. Yeah, different kind of applications, I guess. Mm. Mm. Certainly yeah. not burning any calorie or as many calories on her funds. <laughs> <laughs> right, mm. uh, and can I, have you seen, sort of either models of bikes uh, in other places or in technical development that you think, wow, that's, that's the next phase? Are, are, we, are we going to see big developments in the nature of e-bikes and e-scooters in the coming three to five years? I think right. there's, or, there's some solutions in, like, uh, in other countries that are like a bit of a wow factor. Like in, there's a, in Taiwan, there's a company called Gogoro and they have, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a share economy with the actual battery packs. So it reduces the cost of, um, of ownership quite a lot. And um, you, there's like a switch in switch out technology. So you could imagine like at a, I guess say maybe a train station, all lockers and they're full of battery packs. And so you don't charge um, yourself, you switch out or you can have the option to charge. And I think something like that is you know, that's, that's a, to me, a bit of a wow factor. I'm not sure if it's a really suitable solution in Australia because we just don't have that level of um, density in our, in our cities and, and towns and everything. So I, I think that's like, you know, there, there are some things that you're like, wow, that's really impressive. And that's something when it's on a big scale in, in big cities can really work well. Wow. Yeah. Yep. And Luke, have you seen, have you seen applications or actual vehicles that you think, wow, that's, that's where I want to go. Um, I look, yeah, there's some really interesting stuff coming through in other countries. I think um, 
one of the things I find challenging in Australia is, you know, uh, there's like, uh, I mean, there's a lot of potential because they're light and, you know, they're light electric vehicles. So we almost need separate infrastructure for them, like, you know, like getting off the heavy roads and infrastructure, you know, when we get into electric automated trucking to transport goods. I mean, a lot of the, the driving that we do is around, you know, within the 20, you know, 20 kilometre range. So, I mean, Byron would be a great place if, if we did it to have like a, a trial electric, light electric vehicle corridor because you can have vehicles that are, say, maximum speed is 50 kilometres an hour and they um, are lightweight. So the infrastructure mm. needs are uh, far less and they're obviously a lot, lot safer as well. So I think um, the door then for really small vehicles, you know, with two seaters with a bit of luggage space in the back, that sort of thing. Mm. People just to zip around the neighbourhood and, and, and around town. Um, and also like there'd be licensing different. So that's down the track a bit. That's really something that on a legislation sort of um, area that we really have to look at into the future about like how we're going to be getting around. Do we want these light little electric vehicles on these heavy roadways with these trucks and really fast speeds? And, like, do we need to build that infrastructure for you to have the big vehicles outside of the community areas or, you know, the central areas and people just use small small vehicles to get around the inner, inner, inner city areas and in the, in the town. It's like a, they do a lot of that in China, you know, these areas where you have, they have huge, where you leave your, your petrol vehicle and then you get in a small electric vehicle to get around the, the town from there. Right. So, Right. Um, what, one of the other things I'd like to take up again with both of you, but I'll come back to you, Michelle, is the service costs. Now, anyone who's, who's had a, an internal combustion engine motorcycle needs that you need to, you know, regularly service them to get maximum yeah. performance. With, with an e-bike or an e-scooter, what kind of servicing is required and how expensive is it? Yeah, um, there's not a whole lot of servicing required. It's um, brake suspension, um, you know, terminals um, and lubrication and checking software. Um, it takes, if there's absolutely nothing to do, it can take as little as 30 minutes to an hour. Um, we do a cap price service um, so in the Northern Rivers, we offer that for 150 bucks and um, that includes a detail of the bike. So a lot of people forget to clean them and um, <laughs> it's not very good for your bike not to clean your bike. <laughs> so we just add that in. So $150 is the price. So it's, it's inexpensive, yeah. Right. And Luke, is, are, you, do you, are, they, are they costs that are significant to you, those, those service costs for Sunshine Cycles? No, it's pretty much the same thing. It's just bike maintenance. Um, the electrical side needs very little mo uh, uh, maintenance. It's all um, either wirings, plug and play. If you're having wiring issues, just remove like whatever wire it is, or if it's a component, you can just swap it out. So um, yeah, look, it's it's really just uh, keeping on top of the bike maintenance. Um, like Michelle was saying, your brakes and um, that, that sort of thing, just safety checks. But uh, yeah, no, it's it's not expensive at all. Right. Now, now, in terms of, I mean, people are growing uh, more and more familiar, I think, with the fact that there are charging stations. I know in Byron Shire, there's, there's various, you know, at the library, there's one at the farm for people who are familiar with this area. Uh, are they also going to work for e-scooters and e-bikes where, where people go and charge their, their electric vehicles? Will they also be amenable to the two wheelies? Um. I think, for, are you asking, yeah, for, yeah, for me? Like yeah, and then maybe to yeah, 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 sure. Um, with our motorcycle, we're in development with a, we've, we've got a solution and we're not currently offering it. Some people have pre-ordered. Um, so you can, it's not compatible with Tesla because Tesla is non-universal, but you can make them compatible with, with the universal, which is the type two. Yeah. Right. Right. And just, just to clarify this, so, so that at one point we did see the, the battery, the, the bike obviously opened up and the battery slid out. Just go through, you, you've been out on your bike, you need to recharge. What are you actually doing? What, what's the actual yeah. process? So oh, I'll just pull up a picture. So you can see, am I on the screen? No. Is my, is my picture on the screen? No, just you. Oh, just me. Oh, I won't pull up a picture then. Okay. Um, so... Um, yeah, so basically um, you can charge from the wall socket to the bike. That's right. one option. Um, you can charge by removing the power pack, which is what was sort of slotted halfway in and out. You can 
take that out and the, the light one, which is designed to, to be portable is about eight to nine kilos, depending on the model. Um, you can also lug out the heavier one, which is about less than 20 kilos if you feel strong and don't have too many flights of stairs. Um, and um, yeah, so you've got, you've got kind of got options. So, but you always to 240 volt wall socket for, for what we offer at the moment. Right. So, so this leads me to another question about electric trains. So do you think, and, I, and I'll come to you, Luke, but Michelle, if, if you want to come in on the back of this, feel very, very welcome. But Luke, do you think in the future we could imagine a scenario that we could charge an e-bike or an e-scooter on an electric train so that they do become this last mile option? Is that, is that within the realms of, of possibility? Uh, I guess if you've got an electric train, so if you're taking your bike, are you talking about a share system where you get off the train and bikes are available or are you talking yeah. about going? Well, well, I'm, well I mean, I'm kind of interested in both. I'm wondering whether that people can sort of get to the train station on their e-scooter or their e-bike, get on the train for a, a substantial journey, but then on the train, there would be a facility where they could charge their battery. I don't know that that's the case. I'm kind of asking to, to whether that's... I'm, I'm fairly sure. Um, it's, uh, it's harder to do. I don't know. The, the technology with electric bikes is harder to do fast charging. It's not really... But I've seen a lot, of, um, a lot of development on that. I've been needing at least now an hour and a half. But I'd be thinking you're better off with a larger battery. I mean, we, we've got all 17 and a half amp hour batteries in ours, where we like minimum 60K. So uh, there's a lot of e out that you can do well over 100K. I'm just wondering how much somebody needs is going to be riding generally uh, of, of a day, particularly if you're getting on a train. So if, yeah, the idea I think is, I don't know if Kelsey was saying as well, is you try and encourage people to, you know, it's use the, the vehicle for what they need to do for the day, which if it's endpoint mobility, it's probably they're only, you know, if they're doing more than 100 kilometres in a day, it's quite surprising they might have another form of mobility for that. Right. Um, was, um, just charge it at night, let it charge it slow and let the battery management system look after the battery. Hmm. Just to stick with you, Luke, because you are familiar, and this is a local question, and it relates to the rail trail. So you'd be familiar that, that there are proposals up in this in the northeastern corner of New South Wales. Some of the old railway um, lines are being converted to rail trails. And, and, and Stephanie has asked, would e-bikes be permitted on the Northern Rivers Rail Trail? So if Byron got the rail trail, it would boost the number of customers. Is that is that how you're seeing it might happen? Yeah, because yeah, as long as they're complying as pedelics, um, they are just classified as a push bike. So it's exactly the same as a push bike. Um, right. So yeah, yeah. yeah. It's different for Fonzarelli right. machines. Mm. So you're, 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 we, we need to think. So what Luke's talking about is kind of an electric push bike, but what you're mm. talking about, Michelle, is an electric motorbike in, in the more conventional yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So in terms of, I have to ask this because I have a uh, family members who are total rev head motorcyclists. Is it imaginable on a, on an e-bike that you can pull a wheelie? Yeah, I an e-bike. Pull... <laughs> <laughs> on an e-bike, yeah, you can. So so monos are possible on e-bikes. You can. <laughs> I don't know if I want to encourage this actually. Are you talking about yourself, Mick? I have no, I have no. relatives. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I drive, I drive very sedately, but I, I have, I have had motorbikes before, and I am. It is fun. So, can, just in terms of both of you, because you're both sort of in this industry, and you're both people involved with developments. What, what are some of your favourite zero emissions alternative to cars? Because we saw in your presentation, Luke, some of those amazing trains running on on the magnetic levitation and stuff like that. Do, do you, you know, do you have kind of ideas about wow? What I would really like to see is is this. Um, yeah, look, I, I think getting either above or below the ground is is paramount if we're going to look after our environment, um, just for the wildlife and and that sort of thing. Um, so. You know, I don't know, like drones is very interesting because they can be really efficient and really easy to manoeuvre people from one place to the other without all the need of the infrastructure. Um, just whether you could do it in a way that's not polluting, whether visually or noise and sound, that's the other thing. Um, Hyperloop's a lot more expensive to develop 
in terms of um, infrastructure, but a lot, it, it just super cheap to run. So, um, yeah, look, I think we really need to be thinking about how we remove a lot of our footprint that we have with all the, the road infrastructure and also the cost of maintaining that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, like leave, that's, that's the beauty of the share economy. You, you get the vehicle you need for the job. So, so for me, it'd be like a, you know, five to 10 Ks around the neighborhood with Michelle's vehicles, you're going further or whatever. Um, you want to go further than that, you might get a little automated drone, pick you up, uh, or, you know, you want to go further, maybe a Hyperloop or something like that. So, um, you know, you so, use so the what, vehicle. So what, what we can see is that e-bikes and e-scooters could really fit into an, an integrated electric vehicle system where mm. all the where all the power is coming from battery storage it's all renewable and it's all zero emissions yeah absolutely yeah. and um, you look at companies like uber which is a large shareholder in i think lime but uh, cycles of using the electric bikes now so you, that's part of the you know if you want to get somewhere that's an option you can use when you're um looking at your on your app you know yeah. they can say well if they grab a an electric bike uh, and you can grab the electric bike down to the train or something and then get on the train at this time. So I think they're really looking at being a platform from how to get from the point you are to where you want to go rather than a specific mode to get there. Um, and then the more things become automated, the more that'll be integrated. Uh, we, as soon as you get something, something will pick you up and drop you at another thing ready to go. So a lot of efficiency um, there. So Michelle, one of the issues that we've covered in previous uh, webinars in this EV revolution series is some of the sort of preconceived ideas that people have been concerned are impediments. That one is that EVs are very expensive, that there's range anxiety, which we've touched on tonight. But the other thing was the kind of development of a second-hand vehicle market in the electric vehicle area. Do you think for e-scooters and e-bikes, that's going to be possible to see the development of lower cost second-hand vehicles that pass some specific test and they're, they're made sure that they're up to a certain standard, but is, is that going to be part of the EV revolution with scooters and bikes? Um, yeah, I think so. I, I think um, what, what we do with, um, with second-hand vehicles where they've been on the road for a long time is we also uh, you know, recondition them either um, if they're a trade in, somebody who's upgrading their bike, you know, we might put in a second power pack. Um, we, we convert some of our bikes where their customer had something where it was a lower performance and then they've, you know, been riding now for three years and they want more. We upgrade the actual tech in the bike. Um, mm. So we kind of keep the a little ecosystem ourselves. Um, and then we do have a, you know, a fairly... Um, you know, robust um, like trade-in kind of market with customers getting their second or third bike now um, that we can kind of reach. Normally, it hits like a bit of a, a younger market as well. Or you know, if the if the battery capacity is lower and say it's at like eighty percent, um, you know, your range reduces down a bit. So maybe you don't need to have fifty kilometers or hundred. Maybe you only go five kilometers each way, and it doesn't bother you have a little bit less mm. so yeah there's there's different options yeah look we're, we're coming close to time um yeah. and i do want to say thank you it's been really terrific having you both to, to discuss e-bikes and e-scooters but i'm going to ask you again to look into the future and and to set it up many many years ago as a young man i made my first trip overseas and i went to to rome and i can remember looking at this morning traffic and a swirl of thousands of of mopeds thousands of of small internal combustion engine motorbikes and thinking, wow, that it was such a phenomenon that I hadn't seen in Australia. Mm. Is it easy to imagine that what we'll be looking at in, in not so many years from now is that same swirl of thousands of vehicles, but they'll all be e-scooters and e-bikes? Do you think that's likely, Michelle? Um, I think that based on the current trends, yeah, I, I don't know if we're going to get to that level of road, um, but I, I mean, I can see it's growing crazy exponentially right now compared like over the years it's just like right now so yeah i think so good and and luke as a as a final thing before we sign off do you think is your are you confident that what we're on the beginning here is a a major change into the way we understand 
bikes and scooters and a major push towards electric vehicles? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to hope so. I think it's really paramount that we do so. I mean, um, like I was saying before, with the inefficiency of, of you know, um, uh, mechanical motorised vehicles currently, um, petroleum based, uh, it's just the heat and the noise and everything. I mean, you go to a big city like Shanghai where they've kind of shoot all the motorised scooters out of town and, and there's this beautiful, clear space. It's quiet. Um, it's just such a nice... You don't have all the noise pollution and the heat and the, right. the smog. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I really hope so. You know, it's not, a, it's not a hard thing to do to transition across. Um, and, you know, the more people get into smaller things like um, Michelle scooters or e-bikes... Um, it, the be, you know the, the the smaller footprint you have because you're not driving a big car right. or SUV around to get do yeah. something to try to okay. pick up the kids or whatever. So. Time time waits for no person, and it's certainly not waiting for us. Um, Michelle Nazari and Luke Young, I want to thank you on behalf of Zero Emissions Byron, Byron for being our guests tonight. Um, thank you all for listening. Um, this has been the seventh in our eight part series on the electric vehicle revolution. I'd like to thank again our sponsors, Bank Australia, the NRMA. And over community energy, light touch and solar, and electrical club car. I'd also like to thank the uh, the, I, the the team here: Glenn Todd, who does our IT, Bridie Schmidt, Muriel Watt, Christopher Munson, and Chris Sanderson. Our next date is 6 p.m. on Tuesday, the 4th of May this year. Um, it's going to be the next level, paying with your car and uh, and smart charging. I will have uh, Nathan Dunlop from Tritium and Tim Washington from Jet Charge as our guests. Uh, look, you know, we've also got a post-COVID live EV Expo and Forum later in 2021. Hopefully, Michelle might be able to bring some of her wonderful um, e-bikes and e-scooters to display at that forum, but I won't, I won't put the heat on her now. And look, I just wanted to say, um, for any other information on this, feel free to go to the website. The W's, of course, then zerobyron.org forward slash webinars. I'm Mick O'Regan. Thank you so much for participating in this. I look forward to your company again at, on Tuesday, the 4th of May at 6 p.m. for the final of our EV Revolution webinars. Bye-bye.